Great. All right. So welcome to UCLA. I hope you're enjoying your time and uh, this will be a great uh, training session for you. Look forward to um, your questions and interacting with you. So you can either have that one or this one. Take a pick. Okay, I'll just use this one. All right, then I have to turn it on. Okay. It's one of those things. Wonderful. So um, in this short presentation, I'll uh, discuss um, microscopy and how it can be used for diagnostics. At the same time, um, uh, mobile sensing and diagnostic tools that, that um, are emerging uh, with an emphasis on global health, um, mobile health, telemedicine related applications, but at the same time has uh, uh, implications for environmental monitoring, specifically for looking into water and uh, uh, air quality. So um, in general, uh, we're interested in creating smart systems for personalized and connected healthcare. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge vision that requires uh, a lot of different fields coming together. It's a multidisciplinary um, uh, approach that is needed to solve something that, that uh, complicated, that difficult. Um, and we're trying to, in general, as a field, trying to address uh, some of these questions. For example, can we convert uh, uh, the patient's home into an advanced lab, 24-7 lab, for medical diagnostics, for monitoring of patients, for looking into, for example, high risk and aging populations uh, to create some preventive and personalized medicine for, for the masses. It will obviously help us tremendously to manage costs by enabling early diagnosis and having better treatment, better adherence to treatment, et cetera. Um, and this is becoming more and more relevant. Um, what you see here is um, the expected um, growth in, in, in population and how it's happening, especially uh, giving us an aging population. By 2050, we will have about half a billion people over the age of 80 and uh, another 1.5 plus billion um, that, that are between uh, 60 and 80 years old. So how are we going to bring um, affordable healthcare, quality healthcare to all these uh, people that are aging that will have a lot of chronic diseases? And of course, the problem is, is, uh, is really quite large. And um, this is U.S. healthcare costs in trillion dollars. We're over three billion, three trillion dollars right now. And um, five percent of the patients in the U.S. make up uh, about fifty percent of the costs. We need better strategies, better techniques to handle the costs. And that's not going to get even uh, better because of this uh, aging population that we have globally, but also in the U.S. So uh, this is one side of the problem. The other side of the problem is. Um, some of these technologies that we can uh, create, convert the home into an advanced lab, would be also very useful for underserved communities and global health uh, in, in general. Can we practice uh, some of these advanced technologies in resource limited settings using innovative technologies, cost effective technologies that benefit from economies of scale? This will help us tremendously, obviously, to uh, create big data for better patient outcomes, but at the same time, understand small data and better better understand some of the odd liars and act on them before a catastrophic event uh, is caused by just a simple big data analysis. So I believe for, um, for this kind of a vision to kick off, the mobile phone, the smartphone, has, um, has, has quite a, a, a charming appeal as a platform. And today I'll, I'll focus on the smartphone and the components around the smartphone and how they can be used for advanced biomedical imaging, sensing and diagnostics. So there are some very unique uh, elements about a smartphone and I'll give you some, some of these highlights uh, before I start talking about their applications in biomedical space. First of all, the camera interface of the smartphone has advanced drastically. What you're seeing here is the pixel count, megapixel count of our smartphones over the last decade or so, and how it's been exponentially increasing, doubling every two years, matching the Moore's law, the transistor count in our CPUs, which is a, which is a known exponential uh, trend in, in the industry. So this is remarkable because some of these smartphone cameras with more than 40 megapixels uh, at the back of the camera interface can be used for advanced biomedical imaging. In fact, as I'll show you if I have time, some of these uh, can be used for detecting imaging single viruses and single DNA molecules that are labeled with fluoroforms. With a simple smartphone attachment, handheld, you can start to look at an individual DNA molecule and size it, look for uh, copy numbers, um, uh, for example. 
It's come a long way, and this is thanks to economies of scale and thanks to smartphones getting better. Another very useful thing and important thing about smartphones is that they're now supercomputers, and you can extract image information, other types of data, and process it right there, thanks to graphics processing, you know, thanks to consumers who like to play games with their smartphones. And all of this is coming together because of economies of scale. Seven billion cell phone subscribers is the only reason why our mobile phones are as cost effective as they are today, not at the price level of a high-end car, for example. And what's very charming, uh, very, very exciting is that about 80% of these phones are being used in developing parts of the world. So it's an infrastructure that I can rely on for bringing advanced tests, advanced measurements, biomedical measurements that are normally done by lab-grade instrumentation into resource poor settings. So this is a theme in our lab and we're creating different types of uh, interfaces um, that convert the smartphone into an advanced measurement tool. In a nutshell, we're trying to democratize measurements, measurement tools. And um, specifically, as I said, an emphasis on biomedical space. As I mentioned, it's not routine using very simple 3D printed interfaces, cost-effective interfaces to convert the phone into an advanced microscope um, to the level where a single virus, a single DNA molecules can be seen in fluorescence or bright field modes. Sometimes we utilize the imager, the silicon chip, the CMOS imager of a mobile phone and create these standalone devices that are used for um, also high-end microscopy. For example, I'll give you some highlights of uh, how these types of devices work. But this one that I, have, that I point here is, um, is generating about a billion useful pixels. A gigapixel image, image of, of a tissue sample of a pep smear can be created uh, with these very inexpensive and lightweight devices. So they're really also uh, advancing the current state of optical imaging, optical microscopy. We sometimes use the smartphone as a sensor. Uh, for example, this one is uh, an Android phone with an optical attachment at the back, which is specifically sensing through fluorescence, uh, albumin concentration in urine, with about 10 uh, parts per million level of sensitivity, like microgram per mill level of sensitivity. It will be very useful, especially for chronic kidney patients who need to be tested maybe every few hours at their homes. Uh, this is another one, which is actually an imaging flow cytometer. It's a disposable chip that you can flush and capture movies of, um, of the cells that are, uh, that are passing through to analyze, just like an imaging flow cytometer would do. And in the next slide, I'm showing you some other examples uh, utilizing the smartphone as uh, a sensor, as an imager. We've done a lot of work on using the smartphone for uh, looking into waterborne pathogens. This one is an E. coli sensor. It's a, it's a bacteria that is obviously uh, quite, quite dangerous. Um, um, what you see here is actually some very thin capillaries. It's hard to see maybe. Can we dim the lights, at least the spotlights over here? So what you see here, maybe now much better, these are tiny capillaries that are maybe as thin as your human hair. Uh, and they have um, about a diameter of uh, 0.1 millimeters. You can flush through that capillary, which is functionalized to capture specifically and sensitively E. coli particles. And then you can flush a secondary uh, quantum dot or, or any, any fluorescent label to make this capillary glow. The amount of fluorescence color will correlate with E. coli, and you can actually have a very inexpensive system there to look at uh, various different sources. Like in this case, we've tested milk and water samples to show that you can detect about one colony-forming unit per mill level of sensitivity with a very inexpensive uh, device that is read through the smartphone. This one is another example. It's targeting GRD assist. These are waterborne pathogens. Um, they're cysts, they're very, uh, they have very thick cell walls, that's why they're resistant to chlorine, and even, uh, uh, even under uh, cold water outside, they can survive up to maybe uh, several months. So what, what you see here is as an interface that's using the smartphone and its imaging uh, interface as a, as a sensor for uh, GRD. You have this thin membrane over here, which is where you uh, flush water of interest to be tested. And all the, all the GRDA particles that are about five to six microns in, in, in size will be captured on the top of this membrane. And this is uh, 
plugged at the back of the camera interface where you capture a fluorescence image of the uh, membrane. This is then sent to a server which uses machine learning to recognize this, the, the, the size and shape of these GRDA particle cysts and then sends it back to the cell phone um, with a final count uh, of the um, density of these uh, particles. So it's, it's a very um, uh, elegant device that uses imaging interface, microscopy interface of, of a smartphone fluorescence microscope, as well as some front end processing and at the server end, some machine learning to close the loop without the need for a microbiologist, without the need for an expert, you can actually have these counted. And these are platforms that you can utilize for different things. This one on the corner is another one. It's actually a, a microscope that's tailored for blood analysis. Red blood cell density and white blood cell density can be measured with about five to six percent accuracy compared to uh, uh, an FDA approved uh, hematology analyzer. Um, and this one is, is another example how it can be used for water related uh, applications. In this case, you're looking into um, a sensor that's based on nanoparticles uh, that are coated with some optimers. Um, and in this case, these optimers are specific. Uh, they have a high affinity for um, heavy metals like mercury ions in this case. So if there is mercury ions in your water of interest that you want to test, um, the, um, the nanoparticles are losing their aptimers and start to cluster. As a result of this clustering, the color, the, 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 the scattering color coming from the solution containing the nanoparticles uh, is starting to shift toward red. So basically in this device with an Android phone and a very inexpensive um, um, uh, design here, we're looking and quantifying this red shift to correlate with essentially uh, mercury uh, uh, ion concentration in, in drinking water. This is a very sensitive measurement, even though it's done on a, a mobile phone. You can uh, achieve about three to four nanograms per mil level of sensitivity on the same level as recommended by WHO. And this is a platform, again, that you can tailor to different types of um, uh, metals. Uh, it's very specific and sensitive. Um, some other examples are shown here. If I have time, I'll talk about this. It's a reader for um, weld plates. Weld plates are, um, they form a, a platform for high throughput screening, especially used for clinical microbiology applications uh, for, for sensing uh, in, a, in a high throughput fashion. Each one of these wells, typically there are 96 of them, depending on the format that you use. Each one of them can contain a different sample. So in a single uh, plate, you can have various different samples uh, tested or screened for various different things. Uh, normally this is read by a printer sized device in a clinical microbiology lab. We created devices that are using essentially the smartphone to quickly and accurately read the, the information, especially for um, sensing using ELISA tests. And at the same time, uh, we've, we've shown that it can be uh, used for looking into antimicrobial susceptibility to understand the minimum inhibitory concentration that you should administer to the patient uh, given uh, the, the, the specific bug that he or she has. These can be done now through uh, uh, these readers that are based on mobile phones. Some of this work has been also commercialized. This is my uh, conflicts of interest uh, uh, disclosure as well. I'm a co-founder of a startup company that's based in Los Angeles, Selmic, which is essentially working on quantification of digital assays, digital sensors. Uh, and, um, and using the smartphone as a platform or sometimes just at the background, just as a screen, we've created different types of uh, products and services for quantification of fluorescence, colorimetric and chemiluminescent diagnostic tests. And this, uh, this company has recently uh, been awarded the uh, uh, Technology Pioneer Award uh, by World, ha World Economic Forum in 2015 um, in Dallas. So coming back to uh, uh, the, the slide again, these are giving you some examples of how you can utilize the smartphone and some of its components for um, conducting um, advanced biomedical measurements, sometimes uh, imaging, sometimes sensing uh, through uh, the smartphone and computation that strengthens it. Uh, there are other types of interfaces that you can also uh, uh, imagine uh, helping us in addition to smartphones, and one of them is uh, actually variable computers and, and specifically variable uh, glass type of dev devices, computers. So in this case, of course, this what you're seeing here is, is Google Glass, which turned out to be not a great product in itself, but 
uh, it has a certain appeal, especially when it comes to uh, um, sensing in emergency situations, especially in case you don't need to, uh, uh, let's say there's a patient in front of you and you don't have the time to wear gloves or change gloves and touch a device. It's hands-free and voice activated, which means you can actually start to read some of these um, uh, colorimetric tests using the camera interface while without obscuring your line of sight while still dealing with the patient with both of your hands, you can actually have access to uh, some of the test results uh, and communicate with the servers using the camera interface that's voice activated. I think that element of, of glass is extremely exciting uh, and, and brings some additional, uh, uh, additional uh, dimension to uh, mobile sensing. Although the camera interface and the computational power of glass is by and large uh, um, quite, quite behind smartphones, it has a certain uh, appeal. Although I'm not going to um, uh, discuss this in detail, there are also other types of uh, interesting uh, uh, mobile sensing applications that involve implantable sensors uh, that uh, will sense interstitial fluid maybe one to two millimeters underneath the skin using fluorescent uh, uh, sensors. This is a very uh, interesting and emerging area, especially for looking into 24-7 uh, monitoring of patients uh, with, with simple readers that they can have at the home uh, uh, by simply coming close to the skin using a mobile microscope, you can actually start to read underneath the skin the sensor that's implanted. These can be biodegradable uh, sensors, so at the, at the end of the six-month or nine-month period, uh, you can actually implant another one. These will be very tiny, maybe a 0.1 millimeter, uh, smaller than even a rice grain type of sensor that are implanted uh, to look for um, signatures by markers in uh, interstitial fluid, which will be very valuable, for example, for looking at glucose um, in an undestructive fashion. There are some interesting challenges there, but I won't go into details of those types of implantable sensors, but it's an area which is, I think, extremely exciting as well. So after this brief intro, I'd like to um, dive into uh, some of the details of how these devices work, and I'll start with microscopy. I'll tell you how mobile microscopy could be very useful for for point of care diagnostics, for um, looking at the specimen uh, in resource limited settings at the micro scale and even nano scale. So this type of microscopy is quite different than traditional uh, light microscopy in the sense that it doesn't use lenses, it doesn't use bulky optics that you find in a normal benched up microscope. A normal benched up microscope would cost you twenty to thirty thousand dollars typically very heavy bulky and that's why it's it's not uh, easy to carry around one but these types of microscopes that i showed here that are using the uh, imager on, on a mobile phone or it, but sometimes taking the cmos imager off and uh, off the mobile phone and creating an interface around it these are computational microscopes that do not have any lenses or any of the bulky optical components as part of it as a result these are very lightweight um, very simple. The main component is actually a light emitting diode, a very simple, inexpensive light source that is hidden here, and a CMOS imager that is um, uh, in this uh, 3D printed interface. That's the same imager, like 10 megapixel imager, that all of your mobile phones have. In this case, the sample goes right above it, meaning that the sample is directly placed on top of a uh, CMOS imager chip. It's like almost taking the shadow of the sample with, uh, with this transmission, transmission geometry. If you, for example, place whole blood sample on top of a simple CMOS imager, silicon chip taken off your mobile phones, and shine light through it, you'll be seeing the shadows of these red blood cells. But these shadows look a little bit weird in the sense that they have these ripples. These ripples are containing interference patterns of the light that is scattered by this cell, red blood cell in this case, and the background light. In fact, they're holograms. They contain holographic interference patterns of the cells. And using free optics, using holography, they can be inverted digitally, giving you computationally the image that created these shadows. So this is a very simple microscope, works based on free optics and holography to take these images that are holographic shadows of specimen and quickly reconstructs uh, real images of, of, of the samples, the, the red blood cells. Each one of these cells is about uh, seven, eight microns in diameter, giving you exactly the same thing that a traditional light microscope gives, except without the objective lens. 
So typical implementation as shown here is maybe a few dollars in, 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 in cost in terms of uh, all the components needed, excluding the laptop. And the sample goes from the side, LED is hidden, and underneath here, there's a, a CMOS image of 5 to 10 megapixel. It's, it, it records these holographic dummy looking shadows, quickly recovers the phase information, and then um, it, it uses holographic uh, and, and, and time reversal uh, principles to uh, get back to the uh, object plane. These are different types of white blood cells and platelets that are reconstructed from the shadows of the specimen that are captured. It's a very inexpensive device, as I've mentioned. At the same time, lightweight. This, this interface that I show here is about 45 grams. You can totally put it in your pocket. Unlike traditional holography, you don't need a laser. It's not very sensitive to alignment. You can drop it to floor. Very, very, um, very robust to actually uh, uh, field conditions. Um, and it, it, it has a major advantage, and that is, in addition to being cost effective and compact, it is large field of view. It has a very large field of view on the order of 20 to 30 millimeters square. This is an order of magnitude larger than traditional uh, objective lenses, traditional uh, bulky optics. So I'll, I'll show you some different variations of this, this idea, but even in the simplest form that you see here, you can actually uh, use it for various different advanced biomedical measurements. And in this example that I'll show here, we're looking into HIV positive patients and monitoring their CD4 counts. So this is a very important problem for HIV positive patients because HIV depletes CD4s beyond the th certain uh, threshold, and that's when you need to start antiretroviral therapy. This is today done using flow cytometers, expensive tests. You can actually uh, take a simple microfluidic device and print on, on the surface of that device some antibodies to capture specifically and sensitively CD4 positive and CD8 positive cells. In this case, what you're looking at here is an array. Each one of them is an anti-CD4 antibody array, a spot. So this is actually maybe a, a few hundred microns uh, of a spot where if you zoom in, you'll be seeing the holographic patterns captured by one of our uh, microscopes, reconstructions showing the individual uh, CD4 positive cells that are counted. At the same chip, you can also have CD8s. This is used for reference because the ratio of CD4 to CD8 is decreased. Uh, and that's when you can understand essentially uh, when the uh, antiretroviral therapy needs to start. If you zoom in uh, to these different spots, this is how it looks for CD4 spots. There are reconstructions, and this is how it looks for CD8s. In general, for a healthy patient, there is more number of CD4s per microliter of your blood compared to CD8s. But once HIV kicks in, this becomes sparse. That's when you understand what's going on. Typically, for a healthy patient, it's more than uh, two to three, this ratio. But once HIV kicks in, this drops to subunity. And that's when, I, uh, when you can actually uh, understand uh, something's going on in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, HIV replication and viral load in the patient. This is a good example of how you can take a very inexpensive microscope that's computationally reconstructing images and use it with some surface chemistry, with some protocols to take a simple surface and make it more specific, to capture specifically uh, certain populations, subpopulations of cells. In this case, a very relevant one in terms of CD4 positive and CD8 positive cells. So th this, this platform um, can be used for various different tasks, but one of the um, uh, limitations of this platform, as, as you see here, is its resolution. It has a modest resolution that roughly matches a 10x objective lens. But of course, in a, in a benchtop microscope, you have different types of objectives. You have a 40x, you have 100x, and even a larger magnification and higher numerical aperture objectives to look at even smaller features. For this, to match the performance of these higher um, uh, numerical aperture, higher resolution uh, imaging systems, we've taken this initial design and created some more sophisticated and advanced version of it so that we can actually have higher resolution across the large field of view that we have without giving away our field, field portability, cost effectiveness. We want to be more sophisticated in terms of how we construct images, even at the uh, sub micron scale. If you look at one of these devices, it's still lens free. The sample goes from the side, it sits above the CMOS imager. Sometimes we call the, these types of microscopes on chip microscopes, meaning that the sample sits on that silicon chip. Instead of a single LED, now we have some 20 LEDs. The main function here is to computationally divide the pixels of the CMOS imager 
so that we can actually achieve better resolution. This is the same mathematical framework that's used to secure the cameras. If you look at a security camera that's far away, your face is pixelated. But if the cameraman is slightly shaking his or her hand, you will capture a sequence of images like a movie where every single frame is slightly shifted with respect to the others. These are sub-pixel levels of shift, and we can use this to reconstruct mathematically a much finer image of the specimen, of the sample. This is what we do at the micro scale using that source shifting, and, and mathematically we divide each pixel into smaller pixels. That means if you give me a 10 megapixel imager out of your mobile phone, I computationally give you an image that's about a thousand megapixels. So that I divide each pixel into 10 by 10. So the 10 megapixel becomes a thousand megapixels, a billion pix pixels. This enables me to see smaller features. One important use of these types of computational super resolution microscopes is to look at, into, for example, infection. And in this case, you're looking at red blood cells that are infected with malaria parasites. These are our reconstructions. This is, for example, a red blood cell, and this purple looking thing is a Gimza par stain parasite, uh, uh, plasmodium falsiform, that is infecting the red blood cell, which has a very nice contrast, especially coming from uh, holographic phase information. But the major advantage here is that we have a large field of view. We have 20 to 30 millimeters square, which means you can look at uh, thousands of cells. This is a thin smear, a mono layer of red blood cells. And some of these are white blood cells. These are beautiful white blood cell signatures. All the rest are mostly red blood cells and some platelets are shown. If you zoom in, you'll be seeing the parasite signatures. This will be very important, not for diagnostics only, but also for looking into uh, um, how the patient is recovering in terms of parasitemia. Typically, the parasitemia, the level of parasite in blood, is sub-percent. Less than 1% of red blood cells are typically infected. And in fact, it varies depending on the cycle of the infection. So this will be a great tool to also look into the, the parasite load in, in, in blood and how the patient is uh, responding to different drugs. This is a great example comparing the performance of these types of computational microscopes against traditional light microscopes. A field of view that you would normally get with a benchtop microscope is shown here. This, this rectangle here is a typical field of view. Because of the chip scale uh, geometry of our devices, you can look at a much larger sample. This is a tissue sample. It's a breast tissue section, sub 10 microns. And the pathologist will be looking into the morphology of these um, images at the subcellular level to determine abnormalities. The raw images look like this, and then reconstructions look like uh, as shown here. And it, it matches beautifully well at the submicron level compared to a traditional light microscope. You can also bring color in different ways to the same uh, platform. In fact, we've given these images created by our microscopes to a board certified pathologist for her to diagnose uh, breast cancer with our images compared to a regular microscopic image uh, taken with a benched up pathology grade microscope. We've achieved 99% match between the two uh, modalities, meaning that we not only reconstruct at the subcellular level, but also retain features of interest for diagnostic purposes. This is another example, it's a PEP smear. Typical field of view is shown here, lens free field of view is shown here, and these are some of the uh, images we constructed and compared against the traditional light microscope. One important advantage here is the 3D nature of our reconstructions. As shown in this movie, you can capture these images and store them in a server. And a pathologist, maybe a few hundred kilometers away from the patient, can um, log in uh, to the server and on demand look into different sections and physically move in depth uh, within the sample, which is very important. It's giving the physical depth of field knob to the uh, microscopist which is very important over large fields of view. This is also a pep smear sample that is being reconstructed. This platform can be useful when, um, when you have some images taken from mobile phones, but at the same time, you can also use it with different types of sensors. Some of you might be uh, um, familiar with high-end digital cameras that use charge couple devices, CCDs, that, that are much bigger than what we have in our mobile phones. They would also be very useful here for a much larger uh, field of view. A typical field of view that can come with a mobile phone is, is shown here. Maybe half a centimeter by half a centimeter. But when you go to CCDs, you can actually have a much larger uh, area within which you can look for samples. The scale bar goes here to a centimeter. 
This, this has about 18 centimeters square field of view. It's about three orders of magnitude wider compared to a, a traditional light microscope with the same resolution. For example, this is where a traditional light microscope would be looking at this tiny circle. So it's a platform, depending on your resolution and field of view needs, you can select different types of uh, imaging modalities. So in the interest of time, I'll um, uh, switch uh, next to uh, how you can use the same framework to look at tiny objects like viruses and, and nanoparticles. This is a very difficult problem. Trying to see a nanoparticle or a virus with these types of microscopes is trying to see, like, is, is like analogous to trying to see the moon in a sunny day. It's very difficult. You'll be seeing direct sunlight. We've solved this problem of seeing these tiny objects using actually some self-assembly processes. If you take two rings and dip them into a soap solution and take them apart, between the rings, you form through self-assembly a thin membrane. This exact membrane is happening at the nanoscale around individual viruses and nanoparticles captured on a surface. So these tiny membranes here, uh, shown with red color, has the same exact geometry, a catenoid in this case, as shown here. And these are self-assembling around individual particles. And you can have this done in a field portable de design. What you see here is the same super resolution microscope. It's upside down. CMOS imager goes at the top. Illumination is at the bottom. It's firing from bottom to top. The sample goes from the side. What is different here is that there is a reservoir of polyethylene glycol. It's essentially um, heated up to about 100 Celsius. It evaporates and condenses to give you some room temperature. Nano lenses form around individual particles. Before this condensation, you cannot see these nanoparticles. It's like trying to see the moon in a sunny day. But after a few minutes of condensation, you start to see these tiny particles appear down to about 40 nanometers in size. So with this kind of a device, you can start to detect down to 40 nanometers in size with a very inexpensive device as shown here in a matter of essentially one to two minutes. And this is not just a yes or no decision. This is also a quantified decision. You can actually look at the size of these particles that you're detecting with a sizing accuracy of about 11 nanometers. So it's a huge dynamic range from about 30, 40 nanometers to a millimeter scale in that continuum. You can actually size them with a very good sizing accuracy of about 10 nanometers. At the same time, it can be a single particle per, let's say, 10 microliters of sample volume or a few thousands or uh, tens of thousands of particles uh, in the same volume. So it's a huge dynamic range in terms of size and density of particles that can be characterized. Of course, it's not just for particles. It's also a, a very useful for counting of uh, viral load. In a very similar way that I've shown you with the CD4 example, you can actually functionalize the surface to be sensitive and specific to a certain virus type based on uh, some of the um, proteins, uh, glycoproteins around the uh, virus capsid. This means we can actually capture within a, a bottle of fluid and then start counting them, the ca captured particles, using a, a field portable device like this. The sensitivity and specificity comes from surface functionalization, and the lens free microscope, with its sizing accuracy, gives you an additional degree of freedom for rejecting too small or too large particles based on sizing. So, this is one way of uh, bringing um, viral load measurement capabilities uh, or other types of nanoparticle. Um, measurement capabilities to a field portable design. And now we're actually pushing the same platform for uh, looking into air pollution. Uh, this particle counting technology is very versatile. It's very accurate. It has a huge dynamic range. It's affordable and it's, it's, uh, it's very uh, compact. So we're, we're, we're thinking that it's going to be also very useful for accurate, sensitive, and at the same time cost-effective screening of uh, pollution. It's a huge problem, unfortunately. We're losing about 7 million lives every year due to um, negative effects of uh, air pollution. And uh, more than 50% uh, of that, uh, in, in fact, is related to indoor air pollution. And uh, three countries, China, India, and Pakistan, they're actually uh, taking uh, the, the biggest hit. So this is a major problem. We need better technologies. Um, we've created a device that um, uses lensless computational imaging, server backhand, with this uh, device here, a very inexpensive device, which takes in air at a throughput of about 
13 liters per minute. So it takes uh, about 13 liters uh, per minute and deposits all the contents of that onto a planar substrate. This planar substrate is then being imaged with the lens-free microscope. The images are sent to a server, and then um, the server, within just a matter of uh, a minute or so, gives back the count and, and the sizing histogram of what is captured at that point in time. This is based on machine learning. It not only sizes, but also it can recognize different types of particles based on morphology, facial features, and spectral features. It's a hyperspectral imager that captures phase and amplitude images, which means unlike other types of uh, air pollution detectors, it can also uh, have the, have the uh, uh, a nice feature that it can be tailored for specific particles like pollen particles or molds that we have in air because all of them have some unique spectral and spatial features that we can lock into as we image more and more of the same population. So this is uh, reporting everything back to a, a mobile phone. So a mobile phone app is controlling everything. And at the end of uh, the process, we get these types of uh, results back to the user. What you see here is the particle density per liter of air and its size. The most dangerous ones are in fact these small ones. Uh, sub 2 micron. 2.5 micron and smaller particles are, um, they are declared as a carcinogen by WHO. So they're the most dangerous ones. In fact, um, uh, th that's the one that one needs to be very much concerned. So we've taken this device and, you know, uh, tested it with different types of um, more advanced devices. What you see here is a comparison that one of my students took this device and uh, across almost an entire day, uh, ran an experiment next to an advanced um, um, EPA-approved uh, monitoring device uh, that's based on uh, beta attenuation monitoring. This is a device that would cost maybe um, hundred thousand dollars plus. It's very large. It will easily fill maybe a, a small a fraction of this room, and it requires maintenance every day. So we're getting the same level of accuracy um, with respect to uh, those advanced devices with with our inexpensive devices. We've taken this device also around LAX and ran uh, a study uh, there to show the impact of LAX uh, on air pollution. We've taken across a 24 hour period, two devices and with a shuttle basically, we were sampling um, two different directions. One along the direction of the flights that are landing and orthogonal to it, especially this direction where flights are landing toward LAX. This is the direction where pollution is, is most affecting and spreading due to the wind, because when the flights are landing, they're actually facing the wind, and the wind factor spills the uh, particles to a much larger distance than in the orthogonal direction. And we've shown that actually uh, the impact of air pollution in terms of the average particle uh, uh, density, particle number per liter, in this direction that the flights are landing, it, it exists almost up to um, eight to nine kilometers away from LAX. That's, the, that's the, the wind factor. This is happening almost anywhere in the world because most uh, airports are designed such, such that the uh, planes are facing the wind. This point here, uh, we initially thought that it was an abnormal measurement in the sense that it's not following this exponential drop, drop in uh, particle density. After we closely looked into uh, this point, in fact, this is the impact of a local um, um, local construction. There was a construction, a large scale construction, about 100 meters away from this location here. And you're seeing the local impact of that construction in terms of this differentially increase with respect to the baseline. So this is a very useful tool that, that can help us both indoor and outdoor air pollution measurements in a very accurate way and form essentially a network. And what's very interesting from our point of view is that it can learn. It can learn the signatures of different types of mold and pollen particles and other types of bioaerosols, which is something extremely exciting because there's nothing that can do this kind of measurement today. So I'll, I'll, I'll skip um, uh, this slide um, in the interest of time because I'm running out of time. Basically, um, the same type of uh, measurement system can also be um, uh, sensitive to um, protein uh, or DNA microarrays. So basically, you can use metal optics or plasmonics to bring sensitivity to monolayer of binding events, which is something that's ex extremely important, especially um, in, in, in genomics uh, and, and proteomics uh, because of the um, uh, binding kinetics that are very important for uh, DNA hybridization or protein um, 
binding uh, to a surface. These types of um, measurements, uh, binding kinetics, can be uh, measured using these types of uh, devices uh, uh, based on lens-free imaging as well. So to conclude, indeed, we, we have huge opportunities in utilizing the smartphone and its components uh, as, as a platform for uh, bringing advanced biomedical measurements to field locations to uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, to resource limited settings with very compact cost effective um, interfaces that are uh, obviously very appealing for mobile measurements, mobile health telemedicine applications. Uh, uh, but at the same time, they're matching the performance that you would expect in high grade instrumentation FDA approved devices again and again in different types of settings. So that gives us unique opportunities to actually do some of these tests at the home or even in uh, resource limited settings in, in point of care offices so that sensing, imaging, and diagnostics could be, um, could be democratized in terms of their reach to uh, masses with cost effective interfaces. Thank you. Amazing. 40 minutes. Yeah. Okay, good. I, I can do it. Okay. <laughs> so, so um, can you even ask questions? It's like a, that was a nanoparticle <laughs> per second going right through you. Do we have, are there any questions? So, I have a question. Sure. It was amazing. First, thank you. Thanks. Um, so, I'm a social scientist, let's just start there. Uh, but is, can these sensors be used, for instance, in drinking water or toilet water to detect drug use or drug overdose or that sort of? Uh, in, yes, in principle, yes. Um, so I think um, there are different ways that one could um, um, look into uh, uh, drugs of abuse um, through the skin, through hair, uh, through urine. So you can definitely have uh, smart toilets that can uh, be, uh, be yeah, that, that can definitely, uh, there, are, there are companies that are exploring it for more biomedical applications, not drugs of abuse. Um, and and there, there are already some investment going on into smart toilets that would look into uh, uh, parasites, for example, mm -hmm. in, in stool, etc., so that they will literally install a microscope there and some front end for uh, pre preparing the sample so that it can be imaged. So that's a much more difficult problem than looking into uh, some of these uh, uh, bio, 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 biomarkers of drugs of abuse. Uh, I think that's definitely very easy to do uh, in urine with a smart toilet, uh, without a microscope, with basically some uh, replaceable cartridges that can be fluorescence based or that can change color with a very inexpensive light emitting diode and photo detectors you can look into uh, uh, what's the change and you know is it yes or no is it above a certain threshold and it will tell you easily when it's, it needs to be replaced i think that's definitely doable uh, the most precise one that would be the hair uh, if you take hair yes if you take hair hair that will tell you um, your time profile through, right, but that's not immediate. That's, that's not immediate. Yeah, yeah that, that's you set that, that off to get out. Yes, right? mass. Well, mass spectroscopy is also, I think, uh, transforming into uh, faster and mobile uh, implementations, but still very costly. Not for individual use, maybe for maybe forensics. But the the gold standard for this, in terms of <laughs> all that uh, time profile of what you were using for how long, and that that, that can be done through uh, the hair. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Come on, I think so. Are you using your cell uh, access uh, to uh, these next access to speak in for global health? Uh, I was thinking of HIV pregnant women. Uh, there are several here who have experiences and interests. Has, has that been deployed? So, we've done uh, work, uh, we were funded by NIH Fogarty Center. Um, we've done some work. Um, that's where I think some of we've done uh, different um, we created different types of technologies for CD4, CD8, lymphocyte uh, tracking of, of uh, the immunity. So they were essentially uh, funded, but since then um, we don't have any funding uh, specific on HIV, so it's not something that, that, that's continuing. However, some of our um, readers are being used. Um, 
Salmic readers, the, the company's readers are being used in, in Africa uh, for, uh, di for diagnostic purposes, for reading a uh, lateral flow test, but they're not using lensless technology. They're using essentially a, um, an imaging-based sensor, but lens-based sensor that's integrated with a mobile phone for quantification of lateral flow tests. But that technology is deployed and is a product that's being used also in Africa. But the lensless uh, technology, not for um, any global health yet, uh, because it's very challenging actually to uh, create a business around just uh, just global health focus, uh, financially and uh, business model wise. Yeah. All right, thank you so much.